The west of Canada contains the most diverse range of habitats anywhere in the country. The boundaries here are set by unique geography, created by the vast Rocky Mountains, a natural barrier to the rest of the country. On the other extreme is the rich Pacific Ocean, home to part of the world's largest temperate rainforest. The West holds the greatest variety of animals in Canada. But it's not pure, untouched nature. Human hands have influenced it more than we might realize. The source of the West's riches lies in the sea. Pacific salmon have been coming here for some six million years. They were here before the last ice age and long before the arrival of human beings. Every summer, hundreds of millions make one of the planet's greatest migrations. From deep in the Pacific Ocean, swimming far inland to spawn in the very spot where they themselves were hatched. Their journey defines the entire West. The west coast rises abruptly from the deep ocean. Its nutrient-rich waters attract animals of all kinds. Marine mammals, like killer whales, come here to intercept the migrating salmon. This is one of the richest coastlines in the world. But there is another reason why life proliferates here. These flat bottom silty coves may seem unremarkable, but they are not entirely natural. We now know that ancient people began to create them thousands of years ago to encourage one particular animal to flourish. The clue lies buried, but crows, highly intelligent birds, know about it. At low tide, they peck out clams that are abundant here. Clams like the silty substrate, but they can't escape the crows. Digging them out is only half the job. The birds then have to get rid of the shell, and they know just how to do that. At low tide, they're easy to spot because they squirt water through their siphons. That is how they breathe, eat, and eliminate waste. We've only recently understood why the clams are here in such numbers. Aerial surveys carried out in the 90s at the very lowest tide showed repeated patterns of rocks. But because these rocks are usually underwater, no scientist paid any attention to them.
Only when the First Nations people living on the coast were questioned did the answer become clear. Their ancestors had constructed an environment that clams could flourish in. They did it by building a wall, which created an artificial cove. Once silt accumulated behind it, the clams had a huge area in which to breed and proliferate. At the lowest tides, the people reaped the rewards. And as a bonus, they gathered whelks and seaweed from the rocks. We now know that the early peoples along this coast were rather more sophisticated than the simple hunter-gatherers that they were once thought to be. Although the settlements where people lived for thousands of years are gone, the walls they built still serve their purpose. And it's not only humans that benefit from them. Raccoons have particularly sensitive and dexterous paws, equipped with thin hairs that enable them to sense prey before they actually touch it. Mink, on the other hand, rely on their very sharp eyes to detect their prey. Some of the walls built thousands of years ago are still in good condition today. The physical landscape of this coast is not all natural. There are almost 300 clam beds in this small area of coastline. No one can say how many there are in total, but it may be that most of the coastline in this area of British Columbia has been modified in this way. People have been exploiting this coast for thousands of years. At the end of the last ice age, this coast was the main human migration route into the continent. Thirteen to 15,000 years ago, people came south from Siberia by skirting along this coast. There were fish, mammals, and plants to eat. These were easier traveling conditions than across the ice-covered interior. and the salmon swimming up the rivers would have been an easy target. In the estuaries where the sea and fresh water mingle, they pause, waiting for the perfect moment to head inland. From now until they spawn, they won't eat and their bodies will start to deteriorate. So they only have a limited time in which to reach their spawning grounds, and there are many dangers ahead. Rainforest wolves prowl along the coastal inlets. These are rich hunting grounds.
Wolves are mostly nocturnal, so it's rare to see them out in the open in broad daylight. Some are attracted by the prospect of feasting on salmon in this intertidal zone. At low tide, there's less water, which makes fishing easier. It seems as if the wolves are killing more than they can ever eat. But there's a good reason for them to do so. The wolves won't eat the flesh of salmon as it may contain parasites that can kill them. But they do like to eat the heads. The brains are very rich and apparently free of the deadly parasite. But the most nutritious part of the salmon is the skin, rich in fat. And this is hard to get at without eating the flesh. So the wolves let other animals prepare it for them. They deliberately leave their catch on the side of the river in plain sight of scavengers. Ravens and eagles then come in for easy pickings. They eat the fresh flesh but leave behind the skin and bones. When the remains are sufficiently decomposed, the wolves come back and eat the healthy leftovers. Wherever they go, the salmon nourish the wildlife on the coast. There are more than 200 species in these forests that feed on salmon. The richness of the West has always drawn animals in. And that in turn has attracted people. They've lived here in greater density than anywhere else in the country. But until the 18th century, few outsiders knew about this land. The first ones to arrive here came by ship. They had no idea about the degree to which the land was occupied or altered. When Captain George Vancouver set foot on this land, he thought it was like the Garden of Eden and described it as enchantingly beautiful. With songbirds in the air and beds of camas flowers under budding Gary Oak trees, it was easy to see why he thought they'd arrived in paradise. Vancouver wrote, the country before us 
exhibited everything that bounteous nature could be expected to draw. We had no reason to imagine that this country had ever been indebted for any of its decorations to the hand of man. He could not have been more wrong. First Nations groups had been managing this environment over thousands of years. They burned the underbrush to allow them to hunt deer more successfully. And they harvested tubers from the camas plants and acorns from the oak. Some think the whole environment here was introduced Carbon testing shows the Gary Oaks and Camas first grew at a similar time to when humans arrived here. Vancouver witnessed an entirely created and cultivated land without realizing it. Over time, Gary Oaks have become scarcer but the few that still exist are in a very different setting. Today, the island which took Vancouver's name is home to some of the most expensive real estate in the whole country. Historically, people were drawn to live by the coast for one main reason, the easy availability of food. And the best and most reliable West Coast food has always been salmon. After years living at sea, somehow they have to navigate through the entire river system back to the point of their birth. Salmon have an amazing sense of smell. They are able to detect one particle in a billion that may be characteristic of the river where they hatched. As they head upstream, the current gets stronger. And in some places, the river becomes so fast and steep, they can no longer swim against it. They have to leave the water to get through. For a moment, they become flying fish, complete with flapping rudders. These jumps are the equivalent of a human leaping over a four-story building. The precision of their jumps and the exact point of re-entry can make the difference between life and death. But if they're to reach their spawning grounds, they have to get through.
The salmon must keep moving forwards. New threats await them at every stage of their journey. Some 150,000 black bears live in British Columbia alone. Huge numbers of them head for the rivers to intercept the salmon. Like humans, bears have a very varied diet. During the rest of the year, they are mostly vegetarian. This is the only time they can get high protein food. But the salmon at this stage of their journey are still full of energy. and they're not easy to catch. Eventually, the bear's persistence pays off. When they catch a particularly big salmon, bears often take it into the forest to eat it under cover. In British Columbia, bears and scavengers carry thousands of tons of salmon into the forest each year. When there's lots of salmon available, bears usually only eat about a quarter of a fish, selecting the fatty parts. The rest of the body and bones rot away and nourish the trees, and they grow into some of the tallest in the world. Salmon carcasses make the best fertilizer providing up to 80% of the marine-based nitrogen in these forests. Spruce trees here can be three times larger than those growing close to other streams, where there are no salmon. The salmon continue to feed animals and plants as they head upstream. Especially at the points where the river forces the salmon through bottlenecks. The Wet'suwet'en people have been here for over 5,000 years, exploiting the narrow gorge that passes through their territory. Traditionally, this method of dip net fishing was only about securing food. But today, salmon numbers are falling. So locals carry out surveys on the numbers and health of the salmon population.
For salmon to flourish in the wild, they must be able to return to their spawning grounds. The vast majority of these red sockeye salmon that left these very same gravel beds as juveniles four years ago have perished. Now, the survivors are back to reproduce. The females dig out reds, shallow scoops in the gravel in which they lay their eggs, and males swimming alongside fertilize them. And some of the salmon used to get a helping hand from the locals. The Helsic, who call themselves the Salmon People, still know the salmon's spawning behavior very well. But their ancestors had remarkable ways of helping them. As soon as the eggs were laid and fertilized, these people gathered them and carefully placed them in cedar bentwood boxes, lined with moss, to help keep them moist. They were then taken away and put into a different free-running river. The temperate rainforest provided everything that the First Nations needed and was their home. Cedar trees were used for everything from houses and canoes to boxes and even clothing. The forest provided medicines and most of the land-based animals lived there. But when the Europeans arrived, they saw the land very differently. Captain George Vancouver, who had adored the meadows of Vancouver Island, found the dripping rainforest less welcoming. He wrote, Our residence here was truly forlorn. An awful silence pervaded the gloomy forests, whilst animated nature seemed to have deserted the neighboring country. In fact, Vancouver's men just didn't know where to look. The temperate rainforest was teeming with life, like the unique white spirit bear only found in British Columbia. Today, there are less than 200 left. But much of life in the forest lives in the canopy. If the British had looked up in the trees, they would have seen vast nests, the largest in all of Canada, that sometimes weigh two tons. Home to the bald eagle. The chicks need to attract their mother's attention by screeching the loudest for food. They add a kilo in weight each week and need to take everything offered from mum's beak. The fastest to grow will become the strongest and may fatally attack the others. From the treetops, adult eagles have a great vantage point to hunt for their young. The eagle's superb eyesight and powerful talons usually make the hunt a foregone conclusion.
The vast forested area of the Helsig was maintained by the locals. They saw themselves as custodians of their territory. And they transformed environments when they released the fertilized salmon eggs. This helped populate new streams. And the effects were long-lasting, as the salmon always returned to the place where they were hatched to lay their eggs. So new populations of salmon were created that fed communities, both humans and wildlife, for generations to come. This great forested landscape of huge coniferous trees is living proof of how successful they were. The world's largest temperate rainforest still flourishes, largely due to nutrients provided by returning salmon. Conditions in the mountains inland are tougher than the coastal forests. It is harder to get around. There is less plant life, less water, and so fewer animals. The ones that do live here have had to develop particular strategies to do so. Dal sheep like tall, steep mountain peaks, where they feel safe. But they have to come down to lower altitudes to eat. And here, predators await them. The secretive and solitary lynx is rarely seen in the day. But grizzly bears are bolder and prowl the mountainside for food. The adult sheep are too nimble to be caught here. But their young are much more vulnerable. In the spring, the newborn lambs have a lot to learn about their mountain homes. They have to adapt quickly to be able to move up and down the steep slopes. They must keep close to their mothers, as there's danger everywhere. But their greatest threat is hard to spot. Golden eagles can see a newborn lamb from a mile away. 
They can pick up double their own body weight and fly off with it in their talons. But the lambs grow fast. Within weeks, they'll be too heavy for the eagles to lift. The lambs will be safe as long as they stay together with their parents. A swooping eagle tries to separate them. Away from the main herd, the lamb is in real danger. Surviving in the mountains requires special skills. The European settlers called the Rockies the impenetrable peaks and needed the expertise of the local people to guide them through. In contrast, many First Nation groups of British Columbia were completely at home in the Western Mountains. Entire families would trek for weeks to get through these ranges to reach the coast. There they traded furs and skins for fish oil and seaweed. The trail network through these mountains linked the coastal and interior communities together. But with winter snow, travel through the mountains became impossible. While humans moved out of the mountains in winter, wildlife must adapt to the changing conditions. Big horn sheep head to high remote windswept areas. They scrape away at snow and ice to expose buried grasses. Bighorn sheep often split into gender groups. Females with shorter horns and males with large curved horns. These horns weigh up to 15 kilograms and have growth rings from which you can determine the age of the animal, rather like rings in the trunk of a tree. Those with the largest horns have the highest status. Having fed all summer, the rams are in peak condition. They sniff to detect which ewes are ready to breed. But first, they have to sort out mating rights. They start with playground-like taunts, with kicks and shoves, the weaker rams are tested and social ranking established. Mm -hmm. 
Finally, one big male peels off, and that lays down the gauntlet to all the others. Any male who thinks he is strong enough must now fight to prove it. They charge at 30 kilometers an hour and the impact is titanic. Skulls are double-layered to protect their brains. Duels can go on for a full 24 hours. The winner now has the mating rights for the entire herd. The lambs will be born in spring, when the new growth of grass will be ready for them. But before then, times will be hard. By late autumn, back on the west coast, salmon are all spawned out, and the banks of the rivers are littered with corpses. Eagles gather to finish off the last of the salmon on offer. Eaglets born in spring now try to fend for themselves in the grand pecking order. Temperatures are falling and conditions are about to get a lot tougher. The bounty that seemed endless in the summer is now finally slowing down. But one last salmon spectacle will play out before the full force of winter arrives and it happens in a most unlikely place. This is the Northern Yukon Territory in November. There's a spot where the complete white landscape is broken up. This is right on the Arctic Circle at 66 degrees of latitude. There are no trees this size for hundreds of miles around. But there is one solitary river still flowing, which makes this place so unique. It has a limestone underground spring. The whole environment is transformed, and locals consider the place sacred. They think it's blessed, as the open water supports salmon this far north. And as in other areas, the salmon carcasses allow spruce trees to flourish. 
and give the place the appearance of a more southerly forest. Over time, chum salmon have exploited the open river. They spawn later here than anywhere else, traveling thousands of kilometers to get here. From every thousand or so eggs laid here, only one adult salmon will return. They are now at death's door, and easy pickings for any predator that can get here so late in the year. Grizzly bears have a limited period to eat. Even though it looks like an easy feast, this is actually a desperate struggle for survival. They need to devour huge amounts of salmon to ensure that they get through the long, cold northern winter. They may eat 40 kilograms of fish and gain up to two kilograms in body weight in a single day. Any salmon will do, alive or dead. In a matter of weeks on this rich, fatty diet, the shape of the bears is completely transformed. The grizzlies stay out late here and brave the minus 20 degree temperatures. Ice transforms their thick insulated coats. The Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation used to call them armor bears, as they thought their arrows could never pierce the thick shards of ice. So they rarely tried to hunt them. Grizzlies are usually solitary. But around here, 40 bears gather quite close together to share the feast. There is a strict hierarchy here, based not only on size, but temperament. This is a unique event. Never before have grizzly bears been shown thriving so far north on the Arctic Circle, eating salmon that spent most of their lives far away in the Pacific. But there is an additional cause for this extraordinary sight. The Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation group here have always revered this place and protected it. 
they agreed amongst themselves that no one should be allowed to exploit it or destroy it. They recognized it as a place where food could always be found, even in the depths of winter. Today, it is a territorial park, and the grizzlies are left in peace. From the Arctic to the rainforest, this part of Canada is filled with astonishing wildlife spectacles. It is this coexistence and interdependence of animals, people and the landscape that makes this place the true Wild West.